Warriors, welcome to another important video. My friends, before I get into this video, please subscribe, hit the bell for all the notifications. And if you know anybody out there who's suffering from anxiety, please go ahead and share this channel with them so that we can help them become more than anxiety as well. My friends, today I want to discuss health anxiety. Okay, and I, I visit this topic quite often because I believe that it doesn't get enough quality attention and it needs to because the health anxiety numbers around the world are going up. Okay, the vast majority of people around the world who visit a doctor for some kind of physical ailment is a hypochondriac and they are there because of a bad memory or a set of bad memories. With health anxiety, it's this fear of being at ease because it may bring on a disease. With health anxiety, we tell ourselves a story over and over and over again. Feelings get attached to that story. Emotions get attached to that story to the point where we begin to believe that we are unhealthy or we will bring on some kind of a disease, an illness or whatever, it is inevitable. These are stories and our goal together is to be progressively more disinterested and bored by these stories by the day. So today what I want to do is I want to share with you some of the things that I could not do during my health anxiety days and why I'm able to do them effortlessly today post health anxiety. The first thing that I could not do for the life of me was exercise. I could not exercise. And the biggest reason was because I was concerned about my elevated heart rate. I had connected an elevated heart rate to a potential heart attack or stroke. And therefore, every single time I walked or I ran or whatever it was, and I said, I'm going to exercise today, I'm going to break through that fear. And I exposed myself to the fear. I did it but I did it in the wrong way. I didn't realize that exposure itself could in fact backfire if I did not bring some tools with me, right? And so when I healed from health anxiety, I was able to consciously and with awareness change my perception over my elevated heart rate. It wasn't that my heart rate that was high was leading to some kind of a problem, it was that because my heart rate was high, the most important muscle in my body, my heart, was getting stronger. And because that's the case, I was moving towards optimal health rather than lessened health. So the biggest shift was my perceptual shift. I had made a decision. I made a decision to say, you know what, it's not that way, but it's this way instead. So every single time I felt this burst of energy and my heart rate going up, I said, oh my goodness, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. This is normal. I'm doing something here that causes my body to sweat and detox and such and causes me to become physically, mentally and emotionally stronger. This is good for me. It's not a bad thing. So because I was able to shift my perceptions over my heart, I was able to exercise and I no longer paid so much attention to my heart, but rather I was more focused on the exercise itself. So I was able to do that. The second thing I could not do during my health anxiety days was socialize. I could not socialize for the life of me because there was an association that said to socialize may impact my self-worth even more negatively, right? If I socialize with someone and the conversation doesn't flow or I have nothing to add to this conversation, then how can I ever look myself in the mirror again? You know, with anxiety in general, we want to keep what we have and we don't want to risk it, 
right? So we stay within our comfort zones in the hopes of keeping what we have because we're afraid of losing it, right? So it was very difficult for me to socialize because my self-worth was at risk. I was already feeling worthless. I was already feeling damaged. I was already meeting with darkness every single day, praying, doing everything I could to lessen my anxiety levels, to give me some, some form of freedom, internal freedom, so that I could live my life. But I couldn't until I was able to socialize. And the way I was able to socialize was I associated socializing to sharing wisdom and learning from other people. Isn't it interesting how when we can believe and be emotionally invested in a new idea, we begin to believe that idea. This is straight on CBT, okay? So I was going, okay, socializing doesn't mean a risk in terms of my self-worth. Socializing means that I have wisdom within me that I can share and I can learn from other people. Therefore, it will only help me with my anxiety. <sighs> right? It's not easy to believe in a new idea. It's not easy to believe in a new perception because that inner child within us, that subconscious mind and body, wants to stay in a world that's familiar. It's not very comfortable with change. It doesn't know what to expect. And it basically wants to keep you in this comfort zone out of fear. Fear of doing the wrong thing and experiencing another traumatic event similar to the one you've experienced long time ago when you were a child. So because this is the case, when I'm discussing all of these things that I was able to do, the most important thing that you can do starting today is to rebuild a new relationship with your own subconscious inner child, right? When the inner child begins to feel safe in those environments and situations that he or she doesn't really feel safe in, then all of a sudden, you will begin to believe the new idea. And when you do, it will be effortless. It will be flawless. The third thing that I could not do was be creative. I don't know if you can relate to this or not. If you can, comment below. Creative acts back during my health anxiety days were too risky to follow through on because familiarity equals safety, okay? My inner child was saying, don't be creative because you may make a mistake. If you make a mistake, then your self-worth will deteriorate even more and this world will become even more fearful than it is right now. There will be more threats. So why bother becoming creative when you could just do the same thing that you're doing every single day and be safe, okay? And it is like this overbearing, very opportunistic part of us, very opportunistic, right? It will take every opportunity it can to create defense mechanisms to keep you from doing anything new. A defense mechanism could be something physical like an itch or a yawn to get you out of the situation, or it could be mental like an idea, a story, or it could be a feeling. Anything from the inner child to get you out of something new that it deems as being a potential threat. So, in terms of creative acts, the inner child said, no, 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 stick to your job. You're good at your job. You're good at your career, right? You're good around the people that you've been surrounding yourself with. Why bother being creative? There's no point. You're just gonna make a mistake. But the difference was, now, creative acts are in line with my new identity, who I am. 
it's not something that I do, right? When I'm being creative, painting, singing, dancing, expressing, whatever it may be, when I'm being creative, new business ideas, whatever, this creativeness is a part of my identity. It's not something that I'm just going to go and do, okay? It's a part of who I am. And when creativeness becomes a part of who you are, just like humor can and should, fun, all these other parts of you, playfulness, when these become part of an identity, it becomes effortless. When these are things that you just want to do to step out of the identity that you are most familiar with, then you will be very, very uncomfortable and be drawn back to familiarity and fear. So the biggest difference was me being creative meant this is who I am. It's not something that I'm doing. Therefore, I must, you know, fall in love, fall in love with who I am and fall in line with those things I need to do around my identity. The fourth thing that I could not do during my health anxiety days was drink caffeine or alcoholic beverages, okay? It's not that important to me to be able to drink coffee. It's not that important to me to be able to um, drink caffeine because a lot of people rely on caffeine to get them going in the morning and keep them going. They feel a sense of being engaged and alert and such. I don't have that. But at the same time back in the day, I didn't like the idea of not being able to do something out of fear. Okay. So alcoholic beverages and coffee or caffeinated beverages fell in line with that. Now, I had to ask myself, why was it that I was so afraid of this? I had one or two panicky experiences around coffee and wine that led me down towards the belief of, oh my God, don't do it because you're going to experience the same panic you did back in the day. And because this association and this memory was so fresh, Every single time I heard the word coffee or caffeine, right, it spurred on this alertness. Oh my God, I can't do that, right? And driving by, you know, a coffee store or something, all of a sudden, right, there was this standing guard feeling. I didn't like that. So what I started to do was I started to create a bit of a, um, a socialness around drinking coffee and drinking alcoholic beverages. I don't drink much. I'm a social drinker once in a while. And uh, when I drink now, it's for the sake of me connecting with other people, right? And no longer will the alcohol or the caffeine lead me down a path of panic but instead, it will lead me down towards the opportunity to connect with people at a deeper level, okay? So again, as you can see, there was a perceptual shift here. It wasn't this, but it was that instead. And the more time I took to build evidence around this new idea, the stronger it became, right? So I started to focus on what can I gain rather than what can I lose? And this was the biggest, biggest game changer there was, right? I was gonna gain the ability to connect with people that enjoyed their drink or their coffee or whatever it was. And we were sharing something, something similar. We were high vibing. And these people didn't rely on this, but it was just nice once in a while to connect in this way. So again, as you can see, there's a perspective shift. There's a perceptual shift here and you can't change anything until you become aware of the reasons for why things are not happening the way you want them to. So awareness really is the starting point. And finally, my friends, during health anxiety, the very thing that I could not do was have fun. I could not for the life of me have fun. 
Life was so serious. Take everything serious. And the more serious my healing journey or my recovery journey was, the less I got out of it, right? Playfulness is that magic that allows you to tap into those resources that you need to continue healing, right? So what I did during my health anxiety days was I looked to numb out all my emotions, even my positive emotions, because I felt like if I got emotional, it would spur on panic, it would spur on health anxiety. So I in fact turned all my emotions off. If you can relate, comment below. And I lived my life being numb. I lived my life existing but never living, right? Going from one moment to the next, waking up every single morning and hoping that nightfall would arise very, very quickly so that I could go to sleep so that I didn't have to feel my anxiety symptoms. That's how I lived my life. Now, fun came back into my life when I changed my motto, right? My life motto. Back in the day, my life motto was, life was a dark, deep tunnel right? A never ending, dark, deep tunnel. But I consciously changed my life's motto into life is a joke. Seriously, if you think about it, all the things that you've worried about, the vast majority of them have never come true, right? And so when we change our life motto to life is a joke, right? What tends to happen is, we tend to find the lightness in everything. This is the key, the lightness in everything. No longer do we find ourselves being victims of people's criticism. No longer do we find ourselves being victims of mistakes that we feel like we're making because there's no such thing as a mistake. There's no such thing as a mistake. And so life is a joke means that I'm allowed. I'm allowed to treat things playfully. I'm allowed to make fun of myself. I'm allowed to take myself and this life less seriously. I'm allowed. You are allowed. Comment below. Let me know. Which one of these five spoke to you the most? If you're currently going through any of these, you may want to go ahead and visit the Inner Circle program at theanxietyguide.com to begin your healing journey. And warriors, I just want to leave you with this. No matter what stage you are in, in your health, anxiety, healing, I want you to know that you're exactly where you need to be. And the answers don't have to be there right now. They will be there at the time that they need to. All you have to do is continue to be open towards understanding this journey better and being open to new perceptions over yourself and reality. If you can do that with an open mind and an open heart, you are on the right path of healing. I love you all from the bottom of my heart. Enjoy this day and remember that you are more than anxiety.